After first conducting post buy interviews for the UFC over 20 years ago, Joe Rogan is truly one of the most influential people in the MMA world. With his timeless commentary and informative podcast, Rogan has undoubtedly increased the fan base of MMA immeasurably. Despite having thousands of post buy interviews under his belt, certain interviews stand head and shoulders above the rest for a variety of reasons. In this case, we're going to focus on the ones that made it unique to him. Everyone's going to think of Nate Diaz's post fight interview after Connor or Brock pushing Cormier, but it's not just merely interviews that he gave, but rather how Joe changed the interviews himself. I'm Jason from MMA on Point, and these are the 10 best Joe Rogan post fight interviews. Number 10, his first show. With just 12 seconds of prior MMA competition, 19 year old Vitor Belfort made his promotional debut at UFC 12 defeating both Tra Teligman and Scott Verrozo in a combined total of only two minutes to win the heavyweight tournament. Throughout his 26 fight UFC career that spanned over more than 21 years, Vitor Belfort's name has become infamous for many reasons, some good, some bad. UFC 12 also marked the debut of perhaps the most recognizable voice within the entirety of MMA, none other than Joe Rogan. I'd always been a martial artist since mm. I was a kid. And so um, I just was interested in watching the UFC and then I started training in jiu-jitsu. And when I was training in jiu-jitsu, I was just a white belt. I was just starting out. That's when uh, I got hired by the UFC to be a post-fight interviewer. I, I was losing money. I would make more money uh, doing a weekend at a comedy club than I would doing, it, doing the UFC. Mm. And it just got to a point where it was, just, it was too much of a pain in the ass. In his first day on the job, a very young and perhaps even nervous Rogan, sporting a head full of hair, mind you, spoke with Belfort. Sounds great, right? Well, it turns out it didn't go as smooth as one might assume. In Rogan's post by interview, he began calling him not Vitor, but Victor Belfort. I'm here live with Victor. Congratulations, Victor. And not just once, but on five separate occasions, even though the announcer and commentary team were saying his name correctly all night. Here comes Vitor Belfort, the four-time Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu champion. Despite the Oxygon being flooded with Belfort's teammates, no one corrected Rogan. Even the translator also began using Victor instead of Vitor. Interestingly, in his early UFC tenure, he never called Vitor the right name, going all the way till UFC 15, the last time he was interviewing during one of Vitor's fights. And yeah, this might feel like I'm roasting Joe a little bit here or even trashing him, but no, it's actually a tribute to how people develop as the years go on and how he has in particular. All right, I'm here with Vitor Belfort. Vitor! The experience between then and now feels like a totally different guy in contrast. Number nine, the toothpick. To pursue a career in fighting, it's dangerous enough as is, but Benson Henderson likes to make it just a tiny bit more dangerous. Absurdly so. By fighting with a toothpick in his mouth. Yes, you heard me correctly. A toothpick while fighting. After defending his UFC lightweight title against Nate Diaz, Joe Rogan called Henderson out after seeing the toothpick towards the end of the fight. Did you pull a toothpick out of your mouth in the final fight and you have it in your mouth right now? No. You keep a toothpick in your mouth? The two comically went back and forth with Henderson jokingly denying it since it's not exactly something he's allowed to do in the middle of a fight, while Rogan continued to press him on it considering we all could see the toothpick in his mouth during some of those replays. In an interview with MMA Fighting, Henderson explained that he almost always trains with a toothpick in his mouth and it's just become a bad habit of his. It's not even a luck or superstitious kind of thing. Number 8. Joe vs. Gray Maynard Ultimate Fighter 5 contestants Gray Maynard and Rob Emerson met in June of 2007 for the show's finale. Maynard was getting the better of Emerson throughout the fight and midway through the second round, Gray picked up Emerson and slammed him onto the canvas. Having already aggravated a rib injury during the fight earlier, Emerson winced in agony and tapped out. There was just one problem though, Maynard landed on his own head during the takedown, knocking himself out completely cold in the process. Because neither man was able to continue, the bout was rightfully declared a no contest. Both Maynard and the crowd were clearly outraged with the decision. But it sounds fair though, right? I mean, they were both done. Turns out Maynard didn't agree. He was livid and he even tried to protest during the interview that he was completely conscious at the end of the bout. Rogan wasn't having it though. He took control of the interview and the two even started arguing back and forth about what happened. You knocked yourself out in the takedown. Look at look at the replay. You're totally unconscious look at the replay bro bro look at the replay you picked him up watch the dump bang you hit your head down now watch this you're out 
Watch he this. He's done right he, now. He is done, but now so are you. Now You're now unconscious. Now Look at you roll over. You're completely unconscious. But I'm not unconscious. You don't you, understand. I, I, what I'm you, so you're saying that you were I'm never unconscious. unconscious. Never. Never. After Maynard and Emerson's interviews were complete, the crowd's boos had somewhat turned into cheers because of Rogan's handling of such a crazy and unusual finish. Number seven, Rogan's first fight on commentary. UFC 37.5 was a unique event for a lot of reasons. Literally, it was put together at the last minute because UFC 38 was already booked and UFC fight nights were far from being a thing all the way back in 2002. So how about calling it 37.5? Yeah, sure. But what was the reason for the rush anyway? Well, it just so happened to be the first time the UFC was ever on standard television in the US because the UFC and the MMA as a whole were still in the dark ages in this time and who knows, they might not get another chance like this. And this event also just so happened to mark Joe Rogan's return after four years away since UFC 17. And it was his first time as color commentator for the promotion. I'm a huge fan of ultimate fighting, all mixed martial arts. Literally, I, I don't care about other sports. like. Uh, the Lakers won their third championship the other day. I couldn't care less. If they made basketball illegal, it wouldn't even bother me. In the main event, Chuck Liddell defeated who else but Vic <coughs> Vitor Belfort by unanimous decision. Liddell's still then friend and UFC light heavyweight champion, Tito Ortiz entered the ring which planted the seeds for their 15 year long rivalry. Hey, we may be friends, all business aside, all friendships aside. This is my octagon. Sorry to say it, but Chuck may get a loss. I mean, no bad blood or anything, but at the same time, it's strictly business. Although, I don't really count that third fight. At the end of the post-fight interview, Rogan congratulates Chuck Lydell. Chuck Lydell, congratulations! Back to you guys! Pronouncing his last name wrong, mirroring the Victor Vitor issue from years back. Coincidentally, this is the exact same way that Oscar De La Hoya said Chuck's last name in the build-up to Liddell versus Ortiz 3 in late 2018. Chuck Lydell. One of the many reasons that prompted Dana White to publicly call out De La Hoya. But let's be fair with Rogan here, Liddell was still new to a lot of people back then. On the other side of that though, Mike Goldberg or the other commentators weren't making that mistake throughout the night. Number 6. All day, all night. Nick Diaz returned to the UFC after vacating his Strike Force welterweight title in late 2011. He was expected to face George St. Pierre for the UFC's welterweight title at UFC 137, but that fight was memorably canceled after Diaz skipped out on a big press conference in the buildup to that bout. Instead, Diaz would go on to face and defeat former lightweight and welterweight champion BJ Penn on that same card, when ironically GSP had to bail out of it with injuries, so Diaz actually found himself as the headliner despite everything. It's also kind of crazy to think that this fight remains Diaz's most recent victory to date, over seven years ago. But it was one hell of a win and after famously calling out GSP, I don't think George is hurt. I think he's scared. I think he's scared to fight everybody right now. What's up? Where you at, George? which no doubt electrified the crowd. But then unexpectedly, he turned his attention to Rogan. Good to see you fight for the title. What's up, train by day, Joe Rogan podcast by night, all day. And it turned out to probably be the best advertisement Rogan's ever received for his podcast to date. It was a great way to end one of the most legendary callouts in MMA history. Number five, I fucking love you too, buddy. Usually after a victory, we see fighters jumping on top of the octagon or parading around the cage, but not Sean O'Malley following his decision victory over Andre Soccer Mom at UFC 222. And it turned out to be a really great fight, but when he attempted a question mark kick midway through the third round, O'Malley ended up injuring his leg with an injury that would later end up needing surgery for him to recover. You would think this would mean that he lost the fight, but Tsukumtop bafflingly opted to wrestle for the remainder of the fight, this happening despite O'Malley barely being able to stand. It would have been a chance for him to steal the fight, but as a result, O'Malley was flat on his back in total agony audibly yelling in pain while Bruce Buffer announced that he had indeed won the fight along with a slew of new fans. And then in stepped Joe Rogan, and he just decided to roll with it in perhaps a way that no other post-fight interview would have in his position. He just simply took a knee and conducted the interview right down there with him in an unconventional post-fight interview. After explaining how he sustained the foot injury, Rogan and O'Malley had a hilarious back and forth, shouting their affections for one another. I fucking love you, Joe Rogan. Well, I fucking love you too, buddy. Boop, boop, boop. Number four, ridiculously good striking. After brutally KOing the then undefeated Bech Kohea in her home country of Brazil, 
Ronda Rousey was at the height of her powers and had transcended into mainstream media as a huge global star. Although she was primarily known for quick armbar finishes, Rousey now had three TKOs or knockout finishes in her last four fights. To some, this appeared to be a sign that Rousey was developing into quite the striker. Yikes, yeah I know. In the post-fight interview, an emotional Rogan commented on that very thing. I, I had been watching the videos of you training with Edmund, your hands have gotten ridiculously good. And then complimented her coach Edmund Tarverdian. And right at the very end, he took it one step further. You're the best ever, you're just a, a, a true once in a lifetime human being. And I just wanna tell you, I'm, I'm just beyond honored to call this fight. Clearly these kind words from Rogan would go on to age terribly and pretty much immediately. With the backing and evidently false confidence of her coach Edmund Tarverdian, who claimed Ronda could consistently get the better of boxing world champions in training, Ronda continued to shift her fighting approach from her Olympic level judo skills to boxing. Ronda could box. Ronda has knockout punching power in both hands. It doesn't matter what hand she touches you with. It's dangerous. Sparring with Ronda is a bit dangerous. <laughs> it's very hard. Our guys try to spar with her, it becomes very crazy. She's knocking out the guys. At one point during the buildup, Edmund dared Holm to try and box with Rousey. To the point, you know, she's gonna get out there and box with us, Holly. Wish she does that and Ronda could show her skills, but Holly is not gonna try to box with us. Holly doesn't want that to happen. Holly's gonna be running. Holly's gonna be trying to keep it at a kicking distance. Number three, the toe. After failing to capture the middleweight title on two occasions against Anderson Silva, Chel Sonnen was granted a third title shot, this time seemingly out of nowhere, and at light heavyweight against the defending champion, John Jones. And it honestly went just about the way you would have predicted it. Jones seemingly barely broke a sweat based on how quickly and easily he won, but after Jones' celebration, Rogan began his post fight in an unusual way. Oh, oh, he's got a broken foot, oh man. Wow, John Jones has a broken foot, ladies and gentlemen, and it's pretty bad, and he just realized it. And he quickly pointed out that Jones' foot was leaking blood due to a gruesome broken toe that apparently happened just by freak accident during the fight. Even Jones looked surprised as the adrenaline appeared to mask the pain until that very moment that he realized it. But ever the professional, Rogan took control, called for a doctor, and grabbed a stool for Jones to sit on while the interview still continued. Jones was clearly freaked out by his injury and was visibly shaken by the experience. The crazy thing is, had Sonnen managed to to survive the final 20 seconds of that first round, the doctors would have all but certainly stopped the fight in between the rounds and Sonnen could have become the UFC's light heavyweight champion due to a doctor stoppage. What a world. Number two, Rogan understands. Despite having many highlight reel KOs under his belt, when you search for Derek Lewis on YouTube, the first thing that you'll see is his UFC 229 post fight interview and for good reason. It's all because of one quote that may never have occurred due to two factors. Firstly, and most importantly, Lewis's incredible knockout comeback win against Alexander Volkov with just 11 seconds remaining in the fight. But also Joe Rogan breaking the facade of professionalism and simply just asking Lewis why the hell he was stripping in the cage. No doubt many interviewers would have tried to avoid it altogether and the production crew would have turned the cameras away. But Rogan addressed it directly and then just calmly responded. Derek, why'd you take your pants off? Was, my balls was hot. I understand. Without Joe doing that, we probably never would have heard this response in one of the most infamous lines in a post-fight interview, despite being on the same night of Habib versus McGregor where everything pretty much just got overshadowed by that brawl. And without giving Rogan too much credit here, of course it was Lewis's humor and personality more than anything else, but because of this, Lewis's Instagram followers reportedly tripled in the week after UFC 229 and coincidentally, he fought for the UFC title just one month later. Number one, speechless. At age 43, with multiple UFC heavyweight and light heavyweight titles already to his name, Randy Couture returned from retirement to take on heavyweight giant Tim Sylvia at UFC 68 to go for the gold one more time. According to the tale of the tape, Couture gave up 6 inches in height, over 40 pounds in weight, and more than 10 inches of reach. Despite this, Couture knocked down Sylvia with the first punch he threw in the fight and dominated Sylvia with his signature wrestling for the remainder of the fight to capture 
one last title against all the odds. In the post-fight interview, Rogan was actually speechless and couldn't hold back his feelings in the moment. I'm speechless! Considering all three of Rogan's professions, whether that's commentary, podcasting, or stand-up comedy, they all involve him talking. The fact that he was left without words after Couture's incredible underdog performance just goes to show what a feel-good moment this was for UFC fans. In the world of broadcasting, a commentator is rarely allowed to show any kind of favoritism, but it was impossible for him and pretty much anyone else watching that fight not to be happy for the old man. I've always been impressed by you, but I'm, I'm blown away. I have nothing to say. Please talk. Not bad for an old man. <laughs> making this perhaps the most authentic interview in the UFC's history, let alone for Rogan. You are one of my heroes. You are a hero to everyone out there that thinks they're over the hill. You're an, an incredible person. It has been an honor to watch you compete once again. Thanks for watching my list, guys. If you enjoyed the video, subscribe and like. We upload at least three videos per week about MMA, and it really helps us out when you do so. If I miss anything on this vid, let me know in the comments, and feel free to follow me on Twitter, at JasonTheHeart, or follow the official channel account, at OnPointMMA. I'd like to give a big shout out to Charlie Howard, who wrote this list. You can follow him on Twitter, at MMA underscore Charlie, and you can follow the video editor of this list, MJ, whose Twitter handle is TomMJ more. Many big stars have emerged in MMA for one reason or another. Some of them have been known for their frequent activity, fun fight styles, others for their meteoric rise, and yet still others for their incredible streaks. Whatever the reason, momentum makes it appear as if they'll always be on top until the one day they decide to hang up the gloves for good. In reality though, that's almost